applications of function be continuous, which is you can push the limit through your function. So that's one of the more useful properties of continuous functions right there. You can also do this in a composition. You have to be a little careful. I will, I'll write down the property below and then we'll come back and write the conditions that need to be satisfied. So it looks like the condition should be when f is continuous at x equals a. So it looks like that should be the con condition to allow me to push the limit through the f function. Certainly the first part has to be correct. f has to be continuous. And let's carefully look at what x value we have to be continuous at. So it looks like I should be continuous at x equals a. But we have to be a little bit careful here. Lim x approaches a. Let's assume everything is continuous and works out. What should I get here? Somebody be brave and guess. It's not really a guess. If all your functions are nice and continuous, what do you get if you take a limit? F of, G. F of G of A, right? Everything is nice and continuous. You can just basically plug in that A value. Oh, F of G of A. All right. Now, let's look actually at where, uh, what is the input for the F function? The input for f is actually not a, but is g of a. So to get this, we need f must be continuous at not a, but at g of a in order for this to be true. So f would have to be continuous at g of a, and then also g must be continuous at the actual a value, because g is the function that eats the value first, and then f eats whatever is the result. So it's a little bit tricky. Both functions aren't continuous at a. One function, the inside function's at a, and then the outside function's at whatever that output was. So if we want to use this property that I wrote at the top, we need f to be continuous at x equals g of a right here. So it's a little bit tricky. So that's when you're allowed to push the limit through an outer function. It's a little bit tricky. The good news is most of our functions will be continuous at, mo at a majority of the values, so we'll be able to just push the limit through when you need to for most of the functions that we're going to be looking at. And now what we're going to do is make a function continue, make, make a step function continuous by extending it at a point. So this is what we call continuous extensions at a point. So we're going to take some function that will have a hole in it, and all we're going to do is fill in the hole. So we're basically repairing. So we're going to take there was a hole here, and all we're going to do is fill in 
with the correct y value. So we're going to fill a hole with the correct y value. So it's sort of like plastering over nail holes in your wall. We're just going to come through and patch it up. That's all we're going to do. And we'll do one example problem. So make, so example make f of x equals We actually haven't done trig functions yet. Let's not do that. We'll go with x squared minus 9 over x plus 3. x not equal negative 3. And then we'll be c when x equals 3. And I want to make this function continuous. On all real numbers. So not just some numbers, but all real numbers. So let's first look at when x is not 3. So we'll take x in the interval negative infinity to oops, not equal to negative 3. Negative infinity, negative 3, union negative 3, infinity. Why is f of x already continuous on the, these intervals here. Why can I say this function, when x is not 3, we're in piece 1. Why am I allowed to say piece 1 is continuous on its domain? So its domain is everything that's not 3, not negative 3. Why is this function already continuous here? What type of function do we have? Rational. It's a rational function. And the one x value that we're excluding is the one time we'd be divided by 0, or having a vertical asymptote. So it's continuous because x squared minus 9 over x plus 3 is a rational function. And we already saw that was continuous whenever you're not dividing by 0. So it's continuous when not divided by 0. Which, i.e., happens when x equals negative 3. But good news is we already took that x value out. So we're continuous as long as x is not negative 3. So what does it take to show this function is continuous at x equals negative 3? And we do this by choosing a c value. So what does it mean for f to be continuous at, at x equals negative 3? De definition of continuity. Good midterm question for next week. So let's flip back one or two pages in your notes. Maybe it's not circled, or you didn't bother looking at your notes yesterday because you had a quiz, so you knew I wouldn't give you a quiz today. Hopefully I have the definition of continuity in the continuity chapter. Continuity, continuity at a point. Here we go. That's a pretty simple definition. Limit equals value. Except our a is negative 3. That's the only difference. So we've got to show our limit at negative 3 is the value. So we have to show f of negative 3 equals lim x approach negative 3 f of x. 
So limit equals value. All right, what is f of negative 3 in our particular function? Uh-oh. That should be a negative 3 there. So it matches up. It was a x equals 3. Right there, I change it to x equals negative 3. So what y value do we have at negative 3? Whatever number we pick for c. So we're going to pick a number c. And now I'm going to take the limit. And for the limit, remember x is not negative 3 when we take our limit. So we're using the uh, first piece, x squared minus 9 over x plus 3. And we'll plug in negative 3. Negative 3 squared minus 9 over negative 3 plus 3. We get 0 over 0. 0 over 0. What do we do when we get 0 over 0? Start all over. And you have to use some algebra. So you have to use some simplifying skills. So we're going to use algebra. Anybody take calculus already, either high school or somewhere else? OK, so if you've heard of L'Hopital's rule, you can't use it this quarter. So do not use L'Hopital's rule in Calc 1. So I'm going to write a note here. Do not use L'Hopital's So do not use L'Hopital's rule in Calc 1. That will only affect people who've taken Calc at some point before. And you probably had to go into Calc 2 or pretty far through Calc 1 to learn L'Hopital's rule. Uh, if you don't never heard L'Hopital's rule, this won't affect you. So don't worry about it. There's probably only one or two of you that this may affect. Uh, L'Hopital's rule will allow you to avoid algebra by using calculus instead, which I don't want you to do right now. I want you to do explicitly algebra. All right, what algebra can I do? Foil it out. The other F word, factor it. So it's a difference of squares or conjugates. So this is x minus 3, x plus 3. Over x plus 3, cancel, cancel. There we go. Lim, x approach, negative 3, x minus 3. And now we just have polynomial, so we can plug right in. We don't have anything to worry about. No divided by 0 going on. Negative 3 minus 3 equals negative 6. So all this work, we were supposed to have this limit value, negative 6, be the same as the y value. We're allowed to pick the y value, so I'm going to pick c to equal negative 6. So I need my c value. So I'm choosing let c equal negative 6. And now our limit matches the value at the one point we had to worry about. There's only one x value that we were not continuous right away. And we just filled in the correct y value. So we patched the function up. So choosing a c value, so we chose c equals negative 6. I can graph this function very easily. Let's see. We just did the algebra. The original function is now, let's see, our f of x now equals x minus 3. Why is that? It was almost x minus 3 before, except I couldn't cancel completely at negative 3 because I was undefined. However, what I just did at the single x value I was undefined, I just defined it to equal negative 6. So before our graph, f of x looked like intercept negative 3. But at negative 3, there was a hole. And it was negative 6. So this was the original function graph right here. 
all we did was fill in that y value of negative 6 when x was negative 3. So we had a function that had a hole in it, and we just went in and patched the hole. So we filled in that blue point right there. So any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is like, you know, I was working with uh, somebody, you know, he does a little bit of practice. It, it, you know, he's taking like practice too. The best we have, like, you know, to do like five table, x squared minus, uh, minus nine times that. Like, x plus three, x minus three. Him, he took like for patient two, x, and divide by x, and you go by multiply by three to find the answer. He got like short rate. I don't understand. So he did different algebra is what you're saying? Yes, different. There can be some other things to do. They talk about, you know, algebra, try to do a little bit different. The way to do algebra, to get more, you know, x minus, uh, minus 3, you know, x plus 3. Even though only 2 is x, divided by 3, divide 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 by 3. I'll have to look at that. So I did basically factor cancel. Uh, sometimes you can. Well, actually, whenever you could factor cancel, you could also multiply by the conjugate. In this case, you would multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. So maybe it's a good time to, to show an alternative way to do this. I think you take the derivative over the top. Ah, so he used L'Hopital's rule. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't said the word derivative yet. And L'Hopital's rule requires derivatives. So he should be using the word L'Hopital's rule. And that, hopefully he'll use that in the future, or she will use that in the future, and then that will indicate to you that you can't do that, do that. in this class right now. Because oh, no. okay. I want you to do algebra instead. Oh, okay. uh, now when I said you could multiply by conjugate instead of factor cancel, let's look at that for a minute. Now I think... The conjugate that looks a lot nicer is x minus 3, looks a lot better than x squared plus 9. So I think it makes more sense to choose the easier conjugate. Only multiply on the side on the side that you have a conjugate. Don't multiply on the side you don't have a conjugate. It's usually not going to work and not help. It usually won't help you doing that. So we get x squared minus 9 x squared minus 9, x minus 3, and then you can see cancel, cancel, x minus 3. So generally, when factoring and canceling works, multiplying by conjugate very likely will also work. Well, you got to pick the right conjugate. I think multiplying by their conjugate would make this look worse and not really get closer to simplifying. So our next theorem is the intermediate value theorem. And that's too many words to write, so when we use it, we'll just write IBT. So we're going to write it and our hypothesis. So remember, every theorem is hypothesis. If you get your hypothesis, you satisfy that, then you can apply your conclusion. So our hypothesis is if f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, and why not? is between f of a and f of b, then, so our conclusion there exists a number c in the interval A, B, such that F of C equals Y not. 
And this backwards e means there exists. We saw that in the definition of uh, a limit with our delta. So this is the intermediate value theorem. And I'll put a period at the end so we know it's that's the end of the conclusion. So if we have a continuous function and you pick a y value between the first and last y values. So what does it mean to be between f of a and f of b? So I'll write that over here on the right. between f a and f b means one of two things. Either f a is small, why not is in the middle, and f b is big, or the other way around, f b is small, or f b less than or equal to why not less than or equal to f of a. So that's what it means to be between. We just saved the little ink over here and just wrote the word between. So I don't have to write out two inequalities. So we're going to apply the intermediate value theorem. So show this cubic polynomial has a solution on the interval 1, 2. So before you take calculus class, you might think your algebra skills are pretty good. Oh, I got this. I can figure out what x's make this 0. Well, you can't use your quadratic uh, formula here. You don't have a quadratic. You've got a cubic. So all you really have is a rational 0 theorem. If you remember back to pre-calculus 1, what are your possible rational zeros to try? So take this negative one and the other one, and it's all common, all factors of one divided by all factors of one. So plus and minus one are the only two that the rational zero theorem gives us. Well, I can already see minus one is not in, even in our interval, so that's not going to be a solution. That is in our interval. So let's try positive 1. Let's give this function a name. So we'll let f of x equal x cubed minus x minus 1. And let's figure out what is f of 1. This is the only thing the rationals, basically all of our algebra skills come down to this one shot right here. f of 1 is 1 minus 1 minus 1, negative 1. So that doesn't work. That's out. You can try to factor. Hopefully I picked a polynomial that doesn't factor nicely, even though it looks very innocent. It doesn't factor very nicely. So your algebra skills won't work here. Let's look at the intermediate value theorem. So let's think about our hypothesis. So is our function f continuous on, in this case, our interval is 1 to 2. So is f of x that we just wrote down continuous on 1 to 2? And if so, why? So why is f continuous on the interval 1, 2? What type of function is f? Polynomial. Where are polynomials continuous? I know that was a day ago, maybe two. All polynomials are continuous. We can plug in, it came right out of the fact that the limit is the value for every polynomial, which we did back in the limit section. So all polynomials are continuous. For all real numbers, so they're definitely continuous for all the ones between 1 and 2. So the, 
reason is because f is a polynomial. All right, we got a continuous function, so f is a good candidate for our theorem. Now we have to pick a y naught between between f of, now one endpoint is f of one, which we said was negative one, and f of two, which we'll compute right now, that's two cubed minus two minus one, which is eight minus three, and we get five. So we plug in two, and we get a positive five. All right, pick any why not between. So I could pick any number between negative one and positive five. There is exactly one number that I want to pick in order to show we get a solution. What y value should I pick? So I'm going to choose So what are we trying to solve? I could rewrite our original equation as f of x equals 0. There's our f function. I just called f what our original expression was. So I want to show f of x equals zero has a one solution. What y value should I choose? Let's go with zero, the one we're trying to hit. So I'm choosing y not to equal zero. So we have a continuous function. Zero is between negative one and positive five. So we satisfied all the conditions for the intermediate value theorem. Continuous function and a y value that is in between. So zero is between f of one and f of two, clearly. We just showed it right there. So now I can write by v intermediate value theorem, there exists some number c in between 1 and 2 such that f of c equals y naught, which in our case was 0. And what is f of c? f of c, I'm just going to plug in c wherever I see an x in our original. So it's going to be c squared minus c minus 1. c cubed minus c minus 1. There we go. And this is our solution right here. What number is this? I don't know other than it's between 1 and 2. I can tell you it's not 1 and it's not 2 because I know those numbers don't give me 0. But other than that, I have no idea exactly where it is between 1 and 2. So this is the solution to our original equation. Which was up there. So we showed it had a solution. Now, I didn't say solve. That would be a different story. I just said show there is a solution. So this intermediate value theorem might seem a little mysterious. Let's look at what is happening in our particular situation here. If I graph what I know, we know 1, we got negative 1, and 2, we got so here's two points on the graph. I could write down end behavior of the function, but I don't really care what happens far away from, uh, from here. I really care about what happens in between 1 and 2. So this function is continuous. So I have to, for the graph, I have to go from one point to the other point, 
and I have to draw a curve and I'm not allowed to lift up my pencil. So how can I go from one to the other and skip over the x-axis? The short answer is you can't. No matter what your curve looks like, you will have to at some point cut through the x-axis to go from one point to the other. So that is the intuition behind the intermediate value theorem. If you have two y values, you have to hit, and you're continuous, you have to hit every y value in between. So we have beginning and ending y values. I could have also picked anything, like I could have picked three, that would have worked just fine. I go through every single y value. But specifically for this problem, I wanted to pick intentionally zero. To say I have to cut through the x-axis to get there. So again, I could have picked any y value between negative one and five. So there are some IBT questions I can ask, one of which is just like this, show there is a solution. Generally, we'll pick a polynomial, sometimes a rational function, something that easy to say it's continuous because it's polynomial. It's continuous because it's a rational function. And the way you'll know that you don't use algebra to solve this is, or to show there's a solution, I don't have the word actually solve in here. That's a different story. Solve is much harder to do. The other intermediate value theorem question I can ask you is uh, apply the intermediate value theorem and then find such a C. So actually go about finding the C uh, that is a solution. And that, that part would require algebra. And now we're going to look at trig functions and continuity. We start with cosine. And I'll name my function f of x is f of x equal cos x continuous. Let's draw a graph. That's not my best cosine graph, but I think you get the point. It's a wavy graph. From what you know about continuous, on a graph, does this function look continuous? It looks like I drew it, or it could, it could be drawn without picking up your pencil. There's no holes in it, no vertical asymptotes, none of that. So it looks like it. So the answer is yes it is. And this is for all real numbers x. So there's no x value, no angle that we don't get a nice cosine, or at least don't get a cosine value out of. Unlike maybe tangent, you can divide by zero with tangent and have vertical asymptotes. All right, so cosine's continuous. Sine function looks almost the same, except you just move, basically shift it over. Look at graph sine. I just move my y-axis over, you know, you just do a certain horizontal shift, and you turn one to the other. Alright, so sine's going to be continuous also. Actually, I want to just delete the y-axis and then say it's a graph of both, depending on how you, what x values you fill in. Alright, so yes, also, sine x is continuous for all x in the real numbers. And we'll go to, let's do tangent next. All 
Let's see if you can remember your graph of tangent. There's vertical asymptotes. And they happen periodically at pi. Well, I should say they're separated by pi. None of them actually happen at pi. So I drew two periods of tangent. Of course, there's infinite periods of tangent. You can only draw so many of them. So there's two. So it's definitely continuous in some places. It's not the worst function. Where is it not continuous? All the asymptotes. So all the x values that are the asymptotes. So let's write not continuous at x equals, and we can write them all down at one time. We'll write it as pi over 2 plus k pi. So we'll start with the pi over 2, this guy, and then we'll move pi to the right, to the right, to the right, pi to the left, to the left, to the left. So we're not continuous at all of these. So we are continuous basically in between. So I could list out basically all these open intervals like this, union them all together. I could list them all out like that. But there is a nicer way to write this. Tangent x is continuous on its domain because its domain has already excluded all these x values right here. So we're just going to write tan x is continuous on its domain. And that's an easier way to remember it. So you're continuous, tangents can be continuous on its domain. Tan x, now there's, what order should we go? We'll go secant, cosecant, cotangent. We'll go that order. Seek x. If I graph secant, you basically basically have to graph cosine first, and I'll do that in, do it in a green, thin green line. So there's my cosine graph, and the real graph of secant is the reciprocal. Ooh, I should do start with vertical asymptotes. Not my prettiest secant graph. I'm trying to do it relatively quickly. So it's all the blue. They're not quite parabolas, but they look very much like parabolas. So if I go right down where it's not continuous, I pick all the vertical asymptotes. In between, our function has a nice graph. So let's write down where it is continuous, and we'll go with domain. Continuous on its domain. Questions on that? So how do we turn secant into a cosecant graph? We just shift it over a little bit. So I'll move the y-axis a tiny bit, either left or right, however it needs to move. But it has a really similar graph. And cosecant graph is going to be continuous on its domain.
And how about cotangent? So cotangent, really fast graph of cotangent. It is a decreasing function. Oh, you do much better than that. So there's cotangent. Looks a little like tangent. And cotangent is nice and continuous whenever you're not having a vertical asymptote. So continuous on its domain. Well, every single trig function, no matter what, is continuous on its domain. So that's all I need to remember from all of these trig functions. So we can write all trig functions are continuous CTS on their own domain. And this is what you need to remember. So basically all the trig functions are continuous as long as you are on your own domain. Oh, let's break the intermediate value theorem and see what happens then. So if you incorrectly apply the IBT, what can happen? Let's take our tan function. So here's one period of the tangent function. It's not the period we usually write down. And I want to go from pi over 4 up to 3 pi over 4. So what I'm going to do is er erase the graph outside of those two x values. So let's erase this part of the graph and that part of the graph. Tan pi over 4 equals 1. Tan 3 pi over 4 equals negative 1. So those are two relatively easy tangent values. That's just the 1 negative one y values we get on the tangent function. Well, why can I not, why am I not allowed to apply the intermediate value theorem for f? For fx equals tan x on pi over four to three pi over four. What is preventing this function from satisfying the hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem. It's not continuous. Not continuous. That's the only reason it's preventing. Well, there's only three things you have to have, and really only two things in the intermediate value theorem. Uh, one of them is continuity, and the other one is a y value in between. All right, because f not continuous at x equals pi over 2. So there's one point we're not continuous at. So if I keep going and try to apply the intermediate value theorem, the intermediate value theorem would say I get every y value between negative 1 and 1, which is exactly the opposite of what's actually happening. We get no y values between negative 1 and 1. So if we try the IBT, we actually don't get any y values between negative 1 and 1. So here's a good example of where you can't apply the intermediate value theorem. So we didn't have continuity and it basically screwed everything else up because 
our function did not connect in a usual continuous way between those two points. So that's what the intermediate value theorem needs. Those two points are connected with a continuous curve. All right, so this is incorrectly applying the IVT. There's only a couple limits left in this section in 2.5, so we're pretty much done. Um, to really quickly, I'll write down what we're about to show. If you're starting your homework, that will help you out. Limit x squared to 0 sine x over x equals 1. We'll do a couple problems with this, but that should get you started on your 2.5 homeworks. Or not started, but you should be able to do almost all your 2.5 homeworks now.